and um, unruly as well. It's mm-hmm. like they don't follow any kind of like etiquette of like, oh, now's the time we can talk. No, no, no. It's like, no, <laughs> yeah. this is the appropriate time. Help. <laughs> Hello, 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 and welcome to Well Shit. It really is that simple. I'm Claire. And I'm Serena. On this podcast, we help you to understand about your 12 universal needs, why they are currently not being well met, how to meet them in ways that work for you, and how to consistently do so in quick, easy, and simple ways that fit seamlessly into your life. We'll also help you to understand how doing so will have a positive ripple effect in literally every area of your life. If you like what you hear, sign up for more support with meeting your needs with your weekly Universal Needs Notes at theuniversalneeds.com. And enjoy the show. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, everyone. So we're doing something a little different today. Well, we, we may be doing something a little different today. Basically, in our last episode, as we were recording, there was uh, an example of how to help children with processing their emotions and, and understanding the emotional processing process um and um and i i we we both have feel like we've we've mentioned this on the podcast before but i just went back to the show notes and the episode guide i cannot find any hint of it anywhere so if you happen to know where we've mentioned it before do let us know that would be fab um but given we couldn't find it we figured it would probably be a little bit difficult for you to find it so we figured that um and this is such an important um concept that i think that it was worth us recording an episode specifically on it especially at this time of year because like we're we're in the kind of holiday season and um emotions can be heightened around this time i think is fair to say for everybody there can be a lot of excitement there can be maybe a little bit of envy there can be a little bit of frustration or disappointment um especially with like family dynamics there's a lot there's a lot of intense emotions around this time of year. There's also a lot of pressure around this time of year, which can enhance those emotions. And so, um, I mean, we've obviously done a lot about helping um, adults to process their emotions, but I think it's really important to understand as adults, how we can help children learn the emotional process. Um, And this technique came about because um, I had a client many, many years ago who um, I was, um, we were doing some work around the relationship that they were in. And um, we would, we were like on a trajectory, we were going through kind of some steps of the process. Um, and this one session, she came into the session and um, she was just, you could tell there was something going on. She wasn't fully present. And there was like, I'm like, and she was flustered and like frustrated. And I'm like, Okay, like we could sit and do an entire session on what we were supposed to be talking about today. But the truth of the matter is, I don't think that with where you're at right now, you're going to be able to take in what it is that we're due to be talking about today. And I really feel like it would be good to use the session to support you in whatever it is that's going on right now, if that feels in alignment for you, so that you can address that, so that you can then come back and refocus on the reason that we're doing these um, sessions together. Um, and this is the reason that I often say to people, like when they're going through the content, if possible, if you can afford to do the mentoring alongside with the content, yes, the mentoring can be helpful for the content, but it can also be helpful for the stuff that comes up. That's got nothing to do with the content Mm -hmm. to help you to get through, to be able to continue to do the content as I mean, you can attest. I remember that happened on a couple of occasions when you were going through the program, right? I mean, that's just life. <laughs> I exactly. mean, honestly, I think... <laughs> but yes, the um, being able to have somebody be like, all right, this is what's going on right now. Like, I get that I need this stuff for the future, but to be like, all right, let's get through this so you Do can with handle this. that because life mm-hmm. is life is complicated. And then when it throws yeah. like a curveball at you, it's like, whoa, shit, like. I was planning for the straight and narrow and now all of a sudden it's all zigzags. What the hell do I do in this very moment? Like, yeah, yeah, that's nice. You're teaching me about what to do 10 years down the road. Like, so yeah. Right. 
it, it and I think that the thing about it is is that a lot of the, so and, and to put this in the context of needs put a needs lens on this basically what's happening is that when those life moments happen our needs are being compromised and when our needs are compromised we don't have the resources to be able to learn new information which those unmet needs are just going to be screaming at you going help deal with me deal with me deal with me and it doesn't matter you can try and focus on other stuff, but you're mm-hmm. never going to be able to have the focus on it that you want to and really absorb it and integrate it the way you're going to be able to if those unmet needs have been addressed. It, it, almost, add, it, it almost acts like a distraction in that moment. Mm. You're not really processing it in. Your brain might be like, oh, it's something different. It's something different. This is good. The chances of you really retaining what you're bringing in if your other needs are screaming at you, you might get some of it. But it's like if you're trying in a crowd where people are screaming and, you know, somebody's screaming, trying to talk to you, you may catch like every 18th yeah. word and piece something together. So yeah, those right. needs when like- they're on met can get loud. <laughs> Oh, yes. And um, unruly as well. It's mm-hmm. like they don't follow any kind of like etiquette of like, oh, now's the time we can talk. No, no, no. It's like, now. <laughs> this is the appropriate time. Help. <laughs> um, and so this is what happened. So I, I kind of just offered that as an option to her. And, and she was like, actually, this would be really helpful. Like, yes, thank you so much. And um, she basically shared that she had... Um, they had two children and the elder child, they were saying, had some quote unquote anger issues um, and was taking those anger, quote unquote, anger issues out on their sibling, on the house, on the parents, on anything and everything around, basically. And um, it's, it seemed from the conversations that, the, that they, were try, they were trying to shut it down. And I'm like, Okay, so let's put a needs lens on this. So this anger is indicating that one or more needs are unmet. If you try to shut up the need, the, the expression of the fact that those needs are unmet without providing another way of understanding what is going on, processing what's going on, that's probably going to get amplified. So a little bit like the unmet needs are going to get louder. You try and shut down the only way that those needs are currently being uh, expressed in any way, shape, or form without another form. It's just gonna, it's just gonna get even more intense and even louder. And the the need for those kind of coping mechanisms that that child was expressing at that point in time, um, it's going to be amplified. It's it's a little bit like if you uh, if you have an addictive tendency around something. If you have an addictive tendency around a certain thing, maybe a behavior, maybe it's exercise, maybe it's food, maybe it's alcohol. It could be any one of things. Um, And you just try and stop the behavior without addressing the reason that the behavior is happening, like the unmet need or needs underneath that, (laughs) that are causing someone to engage in that coping mechanism, i.e. the addictive behavior, then it's like you might be able to use willpower in the short term to kind of like muscle through to begin with but ultimately until you address what's underneath it that need is just going to get louder and louder and more unruly and more in your face until eventually you just go fuck it and you end up going back to the the coping mechanism that you know because it's all you know um and so i can understand like there's unfortunately the kind of kind of boomer generation and before um a lot of it was like conditioning children to behave in certain ways and the focus was on the child's behavior and quote quote unquote correcting the child's behavior getting them to behave a certain way rather than realizing that the behavior was linked to needs that were met or unmet and therefore let's address the needs being unmet or met so that we can then create a situation where it feels in alignment for the child to be behaving in a different way but if you just if you just try and deal with that this is why we always like talk about putting a needs lens on something because you need to look at what the root issue is of what's going on not just the symptom like the symptom is the angry behavior the cause is the unmet needs at the root that need other ways of being met and so um and I and like, and this is no judgment or criticism to parents who do this because a lot of us have learned it from previous generations where it's like, 
I just got to get my child to stop acting out, which is what we kind mm-hmm. of see it as. Like, I need to get them to stop yelling. I need to get them to stop throwing things. I need to get them to stop without realizing there's a reason that they are doing those things. Um, and there's a quote, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it basically it's like, beh- like underneath every behavior is a, is a need. And unless you address the need, you're not actually going to address the behavior. All you will end up doing is sometimes having children who are good at masking or who are very repressed or suppressed because, and that might on the surface look like, oh, aren't they well behaved? They must mm-hmm. be a very happy child. There's a reason that what we do is so needed in later life, because that is not the route to a fulfilled and um, well-supported adult. Um, Unfortunately, it's likely to be the exact opposite. Um, And so it's really important that we, as the, first of all, that we understand, okay, underneath the behavior is a need, but also look at what is that need? Why is it unmet? And what are the ways that we can support our children in getting them met? Um, and there's like multiple layers to this. And it is important to say, yes, neither Serena or I, or I are um, parents ourselves, um, at least not in a direct sense. We're very gay mothers. We have multiple very gay children um, who are um, who are like under our wings and we take in support in different ways. Um, and a lot of the time, uh, well, sometimes we can have like people be like, oh, yeah, but what do you know about parenting? Because you're not parents yourselves. Um, and all I will say is that I've, from years of doing this, I've offered techniques and strategies and guidance to parents on different ways to approach things with their children. And consistently across the board the response has been oh my god thank you so much that was just what we needed so that's all I'll say I'm going based on evidence um based on how these um approaches have helped in the past and one of the things that we intend to do in the future is that we want to work with a child development specialist on understanding the needs process in the context of child development so that um because because we want to be able to support children in understanding about needs, understanding what their needs are, understanding how to begin meeting them and then becoming responsible for meeting them much the same way as with the needs that like the physical needs that we're aware of. Like there's a point in a child's development where a child becomes aware that food is a thing. There's a point where it's not, they're not aware of food. They just scream because they're hungry and then somebody comes along and feeds them and they're like, oh, well, that's not, I'm not going to scream anymore because I don't like, doesn't feel like shit anymore um but then there's a point where they're like oh they become aware that food exists and then they start to notice that people eat food and then they start to like start to engage with food themselves and start to learn like how to eat food and then start to learn then they take responsibility for feeding themselves and then they might take response realize that all that cooking is a part of the process and then they might start to learn how to cook and then eventually you get to the point where you have a child who is an adult who knows what food is that they have to feed themselves, that they have to prepare the food, they have to get it from the grocery store on all those parts of the process. And so it's not like you go from, I have no idea that food exists to all of a sudden I'm responsible for every aspect of food in my life. There is a process that takes part uh, that, that, um, that, that children go through, through their developmental years at an appropriate point in their development, they start learning about and engaging with these different aspects of food. The same is true with their needs. Like there's an appropriate point for them to start learning about different needs and then to um, start maybe learning little bits about how to meet them themselves with a lot of support from their child. It's like, it's like you think about um, like children getting dressed. When they first start getting dressed, they probably put their like pants on their head and their like um, hat on their arm or what have you. And it's like, you don't just leave them like that. The, the parent will help them to get dressed. Um, you might leave them like that for a little while, just take a couple of cute pics. But... you're going to school. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's like, um, there's a, like, there's a lot of help that is involved. And then what ends up happening is that slowly the help from the parent will decrease and the responsibility of the child will increase until there becomes a point where it's like, okay, the child is responsible for, ch- for clothing themselves now. Like that. And a lot of the time that's not necessarily, um, that milestone isn't really acknowledged. It just kind of happens over a period of time. And so I think that, and the same thing is true with needs. Like there's going to be a point where it's like, I'm starting to learn about the need. I'm getting a lot of help meeting the need. And then I'm getting, I'm starting to learn meet the need for myself. Um, and then it's like, well, now it's my responsibility to meet the need, but I also have, but I have support if I need it. And then there's a point where it's like, no, this is my job right now. And I'm, I've got this. Um, and so the same is true with our needs. Like that, that's how we want to um, support them developmentally. So, um, 
this is true like these um these approaches or similar approaches are relevant to multiple different needs it just so happened that in this instant we were talking about emotional experience and expression need and we were talking specifically about the expression of anger and what was a way that we could and this child was at the point in their development where they were starting to increase their um their emotional awareness they were kind of around the age of seven i believe um and at that point your emotional awareness uh, obviously like it's around seven. It will be different for different children depending on their developmental trajectories. Um, but around that point, there is a lot more emotional awareness that comes in. And so they start dealing with more emotions. And it's like, it can be a bit of a tough time um, for the child and the parents and everybody around. So it's like, how do we start to really help them understand what emotions are and what the process we want to go through our emotions is in a way that makes sense for a child. Like, yeah, it's very easy for me to, like, you could say to a child, okay, you just need to feel them. <laughs> if you can imagine child, go, child going. <laughs> I mean, I Most probably adults. was like, what the <laughs> fuck does that mean? And I was in my, like, mid-20s when I started to get kind of cotton onto this. Um, and so, yeah, like, there's, there's ways you can talk a child through. But one thing that can be really helpful is to have an object or a, a physical process they go through that can help them to, to learn what the process is. So what I suggested to this, um, this, uh, parent was that they, um, they had the privilege of being able to afford to take their child to a homeware store. But if they hadn't, then we would have looked at, okay, thrift stores, we would have looked at, could we make something that would have been able to, um, take this, um, role in the child's life but in this particular instance I knew they were uh, they were busy and they had the ability to be able to take their child to a homeware store so I said take a child to a homeware store and get them to pick out a cushion that will be their emotional cushion and they get to choose it it's whatever that and you maybe you get them like maybe like you don't want them picking a 250 dollar cushion for their emotional cushion but you maybe give them options so it's like okay you can pick any one of these which one would you like as your um emotional um cushion now it's really important that they choose it themselves even if it's through options because that's one of the ways you're engaging with their personal power need they are taking some responsibility for this they are having choice in this um which means that this is not something that's being pushed onto them like here's the thing you're going to use for this they are getting to be a part of the process and that's one of the things especially around the ages uh, of seven and, and slightly before this we want to make sure that we're engaging with them in a way where we're supporting their other needs while we are also supporting the needs we're focused on at that point in time. So yes, we want to make sure that we are supporting the emotional experience expression need, but we also want to be supporting their value need, i.e. your opinion is valuable. Yes, we want to be supporting the, um, the personal power need, give them choices so that they can engage with choices so they feel they have some kind of power in the situation, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea was they go to this homeware store and then what they do is this cushion becomes the thing that they utilize to express emotion. Now, obviously the emotion that was predominant at this point in time was anger, which is part of the reason it was a cushion, <laughs> not anything else. Um, but also this was, we didn't want them to just, um, to just be focused on anger, to be, we wanted them to start to engage with all of the emotions that they were feeling and realize that they wanted to process all of those as well. So while anger was the trigger for us doing this, we utilize this tool across all emotions. So for example, there were some, um, and depending on the child's age and the, the level of engagement, you can either give them some kind of, um, boundaries or kind of guidelines or rules about how to engage with the cushion or you can actually engage them in coming up with them themselves because a lot of children will will be like okay so what what do you think are some things that we should uh, make sure that how we're engaging with the cushion so for example like we don't use it to hurt anybody else we don't use it to uh, to impact anybody else in any way shape or form so we don't throw at anybody we don't hit anybody with it uh, we uh, make sure that we engage with it in a way that we're not doing damage to other things in the house um, we um, want to engage with it in a way that um, doesn't completely destroy it so like that you want to give them some um, some guidance on like what are the things that um, the ways that we engage with this that feel good and that feel like it's going to be a supportive relationship that we're going to have with this cushion so um, I said and this was the, the big ones were not 
um, damaging anything else in the house, not hurting anybody else, not hurting ourselves and not destroying the cushion completely. Those are kind of the big ones. And there were some others that kind of came in, but those are the biggies. Um, and so then what we do is we say, whenever you are feeling something, you use the cushion in whichever way feels right for how you're feeling. So for example, if they're feeling angry, maybe they're punching the cushion, maybe they're hitting the, the they, they're hitting the, the uh, cushion against a bed um, or like a mattress or something. Um, or maybe there's a section of wall where they can hit the cushion against the wall. I've, I've seen um, um, some uh, therapists use like, um, like squishy toys, like, um, like, um, like cuddly toys, but little mini ones where you can throw them at a wall because you're not going to do any damage by doing that. And the wall is set out specifically. So there's different ways of doing this. The cushion happened to be the one that we used at the time. So again, there might be a, a section of wall that they can hit the cushion against the wall. But also if they're feeling sad, maybe they want to hug the cushion. Um, if they're feeling happy, maybe they want to dance with the cushion. Um, it's like whatever the, the feeling is that they're having at that moment, then the invitation is to engage with the cushion in the way that feels right for how they are feeling in that point in time. Um, and then the final part of it is once you have felt whatever it is that you've felt and you've engaged with your cushion, that you take the cushion outside or if you can, if it's safe to do so, um, or you like you shake it out somewhere which is outside of your space, like maybe by a door or something like that, or I said in the back garden or something like that. Um, again, what are the rules in terms of doing this safely? Like we don't want to be opening upstairs windows to do this. We want to make sure that we're doing it on the ground floor, whatever it is. Like they're making sure that we're providing good um, supportive boundaries around it so that they can feel like within those boundaries, they have free reign to do what they want. And they're, we're, but we're also saying, making sure that they're staying, staying safe as they do it. So the reason for this is, is that what we want to do is to help them to, one, identify that they're feeling an emotion. And that might be something that we give some guidance on that. So it may be like, um, like, what do you notice you're feeling when you get angry? So it may be that they notice that their palms are sweating or that their heart rate is going up or that they're feeling flushed in the cheeks. Uh, it might be that um, if they're feeling sad, they feel like a lump in their throat or they feel like a heaviness in their heart or they feel a heaviness in their stomach. So there are questions that you can ask them to help them start to identify that, okay, this is a, these are the signs that I'm feeling something because it may not be something that they're, they're um, actually aware of at that point in time. When they're feeling that something, what we're doing is by giving them the cushion saying you want to engage with the cushion, you're giving them permission to feel it. And you're saying that you want them to feel it. But also the engagement with the cushion is a form of expression. So like, anger like when you're punching the um the cushion what we can do within that is we can say something like as you're punching the cushion you can feel the the anger coming from your hands into the cushion um same thing if you're feeling sadness like when you're hugging the cushion you can feel the sadness kind of running out of you and into the cushion when you're feeling the joy and happiness you can feel that running through your hands as you're dancing with the cushion like like so what we want to do is we want to encourage them as they are engaging actively with the cushion to actually feel what they're feeling first, like identify that they're feeling something, feel what it is that they're feeling. And then in get, by engaging with the cushion, it's a form of expression. So what we teach them is become aware of the emotion, feel the emotion and feel whatever it is that's coming up and express that emotion because they may not yet have the words to express it. Like and different people do this in different ways. Some people do it with like uh, painting pictures or things like that. But again, we want to make sure we're getting the somatic body involved where we can, which is why the, the cushion is such a good example, because we want, we're going to actually physically interact with the cushion in some way. So we're actually encouraging the child in the same process to get somatically involved in the process as well. And so what we're doing is we're teaching awareness, feeling, expressing, and then the final step is releasing. And this is one of the steps that we often don't get taught. So by like shaking the cushion out, what we're going, what we're teaching them is like become aware of the emotion feel it, express it, let it go. And we want it to be like, it goes somewhere else, whether that's into the ground, whether it's, I said, out the door, whether it's out into the garden, whatever it is. And by doing this, what we're doing is we give, we're using this physical tool of the cushion to give them a physical representation of the steps we want them to start understanding that will be part of the internal emotional process for a lot of us. And yes, we want to get the somatics involved even as adults. So yes, it's probably going to be a, a, a physical part of that process that is that somatic piece. But a lot of the rest of that, we're actually going to do probably internally or maybe verbally. But we want to learn the steps to it. So what we want to do is find ways of giving children 
the representations or um, the actors, like the physical metaphor of the steps we want them to start to understand so that when they get to the next part in the process, which is like, okay, now we're at the point where we maybe don't need the physical tool anymore. They already understand the steps so that they can start to go through the steps themselves internally, whether it's in their mind or whether it's in their emotional body, where it's like, okay, I'm aware I'm feeling an emotion. Feel it, express it, whether that's through talking, drawing, writing, whatever it is physically get it out of my system and release it. And so the more that we can provide that physical representation, the easier it's going to be for children to follow the steps of the process. And we and you can have it up on the wall. You can write the steps up on the wall so that they know what, like if they don't remember what the steps are, you can have little pictures that kind of represent the steps in the process that they can't read yet. So it's like, there's, there's ways of doing this that really help children um, to engage with this, but it, it's teaching them the, those steps and helping them to understand this process in a way that is appropriate for their point where they're at in their development. Well, I think something really important to note is um, very rarely do we encourage children to somatically process anger. Like we, we often mm -hmm. teach them to repress, even when it's like in their kind of own space. No, you shouldn't punch that. No, you shouldn't. Don't be mean to your stuffy. You know, like there's certain things yes. that I can kind of hear in my head and I have a a long background with child development and, you know, as a mm -hmm. preschool teacher. So I've seen this and it was, as you were talking, I'm like, like, that's one of the, that's one of the really big ones. It's like, no, we, we, we do not show anger. Like, and it's like, what are you mm -hmm. supposed to do with that? As an adult, I need to punch something sometimes. And like, <laughs> there was a point where I was not always punching the right things, whether it be like, <laughs> no, if I punch a wall, I'm going to potentially hurt the wall, potentially hurt myself. I can punch a mm -hmm. pillow or a punching bag something mm -hmm. meant for punching like yes <laughs> it took a long time for me to get to that point and it's like mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I was an angry child like there's nothing in my like memory that I'm like oh I resonate with that kind of as a right label not that I think we should label children but like right I don't remember <laughs> that being repressed but it obviously mm -hmm. had to have been at some point because I felt it come out in the wrong ways and then mm -hmm. like working with the tools that we had it at you know, thinking it seems like a lifetime that I've been in this work and just yesterday at the same time, because I'm still learning, but like it, yeah. it, this work really has changed it that it's like, okay, there is this a me wanting to punch something isn't bad. That is not mm -hmm. an invalid feeling that isn't, you know, like that that's not wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes. The motivation behind it, the mentality behind it, like there's, there's nuance with that, but like, yeah, it's, giving a child an outlet being like this is an okay space to do this as an mm -hmm. adult the child can then learn like okay there are okay spaces to do this there are not okay spaces to do this there are okay like ways to well, do that, this there are not and, okay and that's the thing is that what you're actually teaching them a lot of the time is the red green spectrum in without realizing what you're teaching them so the red green spectrum if you um, haven't heard of it before uh, we talk about it on a number of different episodes, but it's this understanding that the way we meet our needs sits somewhere on the spectrum. At the green end, of, uh, the red end of the spectrum is the um, TV dinner way of meeting needs, where it's like it's draining, it's less fulfilling, it's less constructive, it's less supportive, it's less empowering. Um, um, so it's like the TV dinner way to, with meeting needs, where it might stop you from being hungry, but it's not really going to satisfy the need. Um, and at the green end of the spectrum, they're the more supportive, constructive, fulfilling, um, energizing ways and empowering ways of meeting needs. Um, so it's a little bit like the home food, whole cooked, nutritionally balanced way of meeting needs where not only does it feel, stop you from being hungry, it actually fills you up and keeps you fuller for longer because it's actually meeting the need itself. And you're right. Like one of the things is that we're teaching them is that there, is that there are ways of meeting the needs which are more constructive, constructive and supportive and empowering. And there are ways of meeting the needs that are less um, constructive, supportive, and more disempowering or draining. And so like without actually having that conversation yet, we're starting to help children to understand that, yes, there are ways of doing this that are, and again, we don't want to be talking about like the right ways and wrong ways. It's about these ways are going to feel better for us than these ways. And yes, punching something might be something that feels good at a certain point. There are times when I want to punch something. Um, like I've, punched I used to have a big memory foam beanbag and that was like the thing that I punched and I loved that thing because it was great I was like oh my. just stamping my feet can feel really good um 
But there's a difference between punching a memory foam beanbag when I'm on my own just as a way of getting the anger out of my body and getting the frustration out of my body and wanting to punch a person. Like those are two very mm -hmm. different things. And one is the way, one is a green spectrum way of doing things. One is a, not only a red spectrum way of doing things, but because I'm going to negatively impact their needs, I'm actually negatively impacting my needs. So it's going to compromise my needs in the process anyway. So it's like, it's really not actually beneficial in the long run at all. Um, so I think that that's, that's kind of the interesting thing with the red green spectrum. The other thing that you said, which was uh, very interesting, and the, there's a reason that we chose a cushion with this, um, is that you said about like punching something that is meant to be punched, i.e. a punching bag. Now, this is something that could have been used in this situation. You could have got this child a child's punching bag and like, if you're feeling angry, you punch the child's punching bag. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That is um, a, a valid way of getting things out of the system. Some uh, children get enrolled in like uh, martial arts or various other things mm -hmm. to, to help them with like channeling that, that energy into um, something that is more constructive or in a way that's not going to negatively impact other people. However, the only thing that I will say about this is that a lot of the time in our culture, there are certain emotions which tend to be cultivated and certain emotions that tend to be avoided and if we just focus on how do we deal with anger rather than realizing that actually sometimes anger can be an emotion that is the top layer and once you peel that layer off there's grief and sadness underneath and if and a lot of the time we don't give children a good way of dealing with grief or sadness either. Like it's like, oh no, don't stop crying. It's fine. It's okay. Whatever. Multiple things that get said to children in those situations. And so the reason for the cushion was because the cushion is emotional neutral. Like there's nothing like a cushion doesn't say anger, sadness, mm -hmm. happiness, grief, frustration, doesn't say any of these things. It's just a cushion. And that way the child can use it for whatever they are feeling. And it means that rather than just cultivating a specific kind of emotion, which as I said, if there is something that it's like, actually, no, this, this child really wants to punch something. It's like, okay, you use your cushion as a starting point. If it's like, no, actually, I'm like, we've talked about how Serena in the past got a little punchy like um and like it's like if you're in punchy mode yeah let's get you some boxing gloves and a little uh punching bag and you can like go to town on that that might be one of the ways that is your like a little bit like we were talking a couple of episodes ago about like dancing being one of the somatic ways that really works for us in terms of getting things out of our systems um it may be that a punching bag is one of those kind of go-to ways for uh, an individual or a child and it is so important to cultivate the full spectrum of emotional expression and not just focus on what are viewed as the problem emotions. Because also what can end up happening is that you end up with children who end up engaging in toxic positivity because they get happy and they just want to stay happy and they're just going to be happy the whole time and they're not allowed to feel anger or sadness or mm -hmm. grief or anything. Um, and it's just as important, like the one constant when it comes to emotions is change. So it's really important to allow process release, allow process release, including the positive emotions. Like it's very easy to be like, no, I want to hang on to this happy feeling because this happy feeling is good. Let's stick with the happy feeling, shall we? And it's like, unless you allow that to process and release, there's not space for the next thing to come up, which could be more happiness or joy, or it could mm -hmm. be frustration, or it could be grief. Like there's so many things it could be. And, and so we really want to get into that place of, of creating and using a tool which will lend itself towards any of the emotions. Now, it may be that from a somatic standpoint, you then go, okay, yes, we want to also put them in mm -hmm. dance classes. Or yes, we want to also um, take them in the back garden, put some music on and let them dance around themselves. It may be that we want to get them a punching bag. It may be that we want to enroll them in martial arts classes. It's maybe we want to get them involved in sports. It may be we want to get them involved in art classes. Like there may be other things that add as 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 supplemental. And and again, a lot of these things cost money. Maybe it's like we just go to Dollar Tree and get some art supplies so that they can express at home. Or we as I said we put some music on, they can play in the in the they can dance in the garden or in their bedroom or whatever. So it's like figuring out those things that are the 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 things that are really speaking to that individual as a good form of expression but we also want to make sure that we are providing a space and a tool which will allow itself and lend itself to any emotion that comes up not just specific ones um there's something else i wanted to say and it's kind of come in it's gone 
Oh, that was the other thing I was going to say. I've actually done this. was the thing I was going to say. But this is another thing I don't want to, I want to say here. Is that another thing that is really important when it comes to this process and teaching children about processing their emotions is to not completely hide your emotional process from children. Because mm-hmm. so often the parents are so like, I have to hold it together. I have to be here. I have to be present. Um, and I have to always have it together so that the children have a safe space. And yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that you're, you're losing your shit around them 24 seven. That's not what I'm suggesting either. But children learn more from what we do than from what we say. And so maybe you get your own emotional cushion at the same time as the child gets theirs and you, you show them like by you going through it and the things that you're doing. And I'm telling you, it's a handy tool, no matter what age you are. (laughs) Um, if you're starting to get used to processing your emotions, it can be very helpful. Um, or you like let them in on the process because if they don't see a representation, they don't see a role model for what it means to be processing certain emotions, what that process can look like that it's okay to be processing emotions that it's allowed that it's welcome that it's invited that it's okay to cry that it is okay to get angry and scream into a towel it's okay to um to want to punch or smack your cushion against the wall like those sorts of things are okay But so often, because we want to put on this brave face and be this kind of solid um, person in our child's life, they often end up then getting to that point where they either they see it as being something wrong with them because they're not seeing it anywhere else, or it feels like something that children do and like we all know that children want to be as grown up as possible, as fast as possible, generally speaking. They want to be like the adults, so they want to have it together all the time. Um, or it may be that they think that this is not something that everybody does and we want to normalize it. We want to normalize emotions. Like I spoke to somebody um, not that long ago and they have a, a child who I think is around the age of seven. So again, that emotional awareness um, and they were having a bad day and they were just crying and, um, and their child just, it was so beautiful because it showed the support the parent had given the child in how the child then supported the parent in that moment and not in a like taking responsibility for but just like it's okay to cry mummy it's okay it's okay to cry shall I get you a tissue like and I went and got would you like a glass of water um like I'll I'll sit here and hold your hand while you cry and it wasn't like it wasn't like I've got to fix it Mm -hmm. um because they'd learned that it was just a part of the thing they just had to process it and it was such a beautiful representation of what they have obviously been guided to do because in that moment they were able to guide somebody else not that the parent necessarily needed guiding but it actually showed how the child had internalized Mm -hmm. this is okay and it's it, like, and I just want to give you a hug or I want to hold your hand or whatever it is and just be, I'm just going to be here with you while you're feeling sad the same way as you're with me when I'm feeling sad. Um, and I think that the more we can normalize this process at an age appropriate level, I mean, as I said, I don't think that like wailing on the floor and losing your shit completely is, that's not going to have them feel safe. But I think it is really important that they have an awareness and a visibility of the emotional process so that they have a reference point to go back to that when they're doing it themselves they like a lot of the time they'll go back and they'll kind of play a little video in their mind of what they've seen somebody else do that's how they learn they learn from others and if we're not giving them a a representation it's very difficult for them to learn Mm -hmm. there's a lot of times that Claire will and I will go out and we we like to express our joy quite often and our happiness and random facts of just glee dancing whatever it may be and there was a point where I wouldn't do that I mean like I would it, it's weird like I, I I never really thought about it until you know just this moment it's like we don't really encourage showing joy like outward like mm-hmm. you're happy let's dance let's do a happy right. like we yes. do that with children but as adults we're like oh I can't just do a happy dance like Oh, mm-hmm. hell no. Like, I do happy dances all the time. Like, people can tell when I like my food, I get all shoulders. I'm like, yeah. True story. <laughs> like, it's, <laughs> but that's, it's like, it's weird how we don't encourage certain things yeah. for children. We don't encourage certain things for adults. But for everybody, the entire process 
is what what's important. We can't just focus on one or the other. Like, right. And actually, I think this is going to be a really um, like this is a, a good topic for us to take into our next podcast. Um, like just what you've just raised there is talking about the vulnerability of joy and mm-hmm. how um, so often like there is this space where people get into where they don't want to experience the uncomfortable emotions because like it's like, I don't want to feel anger I don't want to feel resentment I don't want to feel sad I don't want to feel grief I don't want to feel disappointment all those sorts of things um but there's a lot of people who really resist joy um and it's it's so important that we allow ourselves to feel joy and we encourage and show our children how to show joy so that we are really engaging with that full spectrum of emotional experience and expression. Like that's that need for that need to be well met. We need to be, uh, to be experiencing, allowing and expressing the full spectrum of emotions. We're only doing a couple. We're missing out on something. And that's not to say you should always be feeling all things. Like it's not like <laughs> I should be feeling happy and sad and angry and all those things all at the same time. That's not what we're saying. But if you are only experiencing a couple of these and there, there are some that you are never experiencing, then the chances are we're disconnecting from some of our emotions. And um, you can't really disconnect from just some of the emotions without disconnecting from all of them to some a greater or lesser extent so it's really important to help us with that and so joy is a really important part of this and again this is a a time of year where um like it's it can be challenging for some people but also if there is joy present we want to be engaging with it and some people are really resistant to that so i think in the next episode what we'll do is we'll go into like what is the vulnerability of joy why do people resist this and what are some ways that we can start to allow that process in a little bit more deeply without um, blocking it or resisting it in some way um so before we move on to the next episode um anything else you would like to add on uh children's emotional processing episode no i am good (laughs) all right well um thank you for being here thank you for watching thank you for listening i hope you find this this tool helpful and if there is another thing that you would like a tool or a suggestion with um that you have experienced with your children that you would like some guidance on reach out and let us know and we will um be happy to share another podcast episode with some tips and tricks and suggestions on that um but we will be back next week talking about the vulnerability of joy between now and then remember to take care of yourself to stay safe and to continue continue to meet your own needs lots of love bye friends that's it for today if you like what you heard and would like to see some of serena's awesome facial expressions check out the video podcast on youtube and remember We want to teach our children how to process their emotions and giving them a physical representation of that process is a great tool for doing that. Well, shit. It really is that simple.